We are very fortunate today to have um, as our keynote speaker, Mr. Ken Hirsch. Um, you're going to be in for a real treat. Um, we had a great start with that first panel, and that's just the beginning, tip of the iceberg, so we've got much more to come. Uh, Ken is a co-founder um, of NGP Energy Capital Management, uh, formerly known as uh, Natural Gas Partners to many of you in here, including me, um, where he continues to assist uh, with the strategic direction of the firm. Um, and as many of you know, NGP is a premier equity and private, uh, or premier private investment um, equity investment firm um, that has managed um, over 18 or over 15 billion of capital since its inception in 1988. Um, through 2015, Ken served as NGP's chief executive officer, and under his leadership, NGP um, invested over 10 billion in its portfolio companies. Um, and pretty remarkably achieved a 28-year gross um, internal rate of return of 30%, which made it one of the nation's uh, leading investment firms uh, during that period. That's, as you can imagine, quite an achievement. Ken also serves as president and chief executive officer and uh, board member of the George W. Bush Presidential Center, uh, which is, uh, some of you know, a Dallas-based uh, nonpartisan institution that houses the George uh, W. Bush Library and Museum and the George uh, w. Bush Institute. He also serves um, as a senior advisor and uh, deputy uh, chief investment officer for the Carlisle Group's um, Natural Resources Division. Um, importantly, he's also been uh, very involved with nonprofit organizations, uh, both nationally uh, as well as locally, um, on a personal level, as well as through um, the Hirsch Foundation. Uh, which is his family's private foundation. He was born and raised down south of the Red River in Dallas, Texas, attended Princeton University, where he graduated uh, magna cum laude with a bachelor's degree um, in politics in 1985. And then in 1989, he earned his MBA degree from Stanford University's uh, Graduate School of Business. So please join me in welcoming Ken Hirsch. Thanks, Jay. I appreciate that. Um, it's really uh, intimidating to come and talk about the where's this industry going, um, especially when there's press in the room, because then it's really easy to come back in about three to five years and say, well, you are fully, you know what. Um, and uh, But I said I'll do this anyway. Um, and getting asked a question about uh, addressing where the industry is going to go uh, is um, is a daunting task. And I said, I was about to say no, but when Bruce Stover calls and asks you to do something, uh, you do it. Um, so, Bruce, thanks for inviting me, and uh, and it's an honor to be here. As I said, uh, it's you don't want to you don't want to ask a question that you're not ready for the answer. Um, which reminds me of a story of a husband and wife who were playing golf. And about the third hole, the wife says to the husband, "Dear, um, if I die, will you remarry?" And he says, I don't know. And she says, look, you're young. I mean, it, it'd be okay with me. And he goes, all right, I guess I would. They played a little longer. He said, honey, if I died and you remarried, would you and your new wife live in our house? And he goes, oh, I don't know. That's kind of a weird question. It'd be so awkward. And she said, it's a beautiful house. You know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't break my heart. And he goes, all right, I guess so. Played a little another hole, and she comes back and says, honey, it, when, if I died and, and you remarried and moved into our house, would you and your new wife sleep in our bed? And he goes, now that's kind of weird. And she says, look, it's fine with me. You should just be happy. If I was gone, I can only wish you the best. And he goes, all right, I guess so. They got to the green and she said, honey, when, if, if I died and you remarried and moved into the house and were sleeping in our bedroom, would, would you let your new wife use my golf clubs? And he looks at her and says, oh no, she's left-handed. So you always got to be careful when being asked a question if you're not ready for the answer. So asked a question about where's this industry going uh, and, and is this time different? I'm always, I'm always nervous when people say, no, this time it's different. And so I would say that um, before I say this time is different, uh, I would say that um, this time is different for us. Okay? It's different for us. Clearly, the unconventional share revolution has moved the world from a period from thinking about hydrocarbons and fossil fuels in the concept of scarcity to one of abundance. 
And I don't need to go into that, but that's where we live today. So we're, we're in a world where essentially, essentially, the supply of natural gas on this planet is infinite. The supply of oil is measured in centuries. Okay, so now when, if you can get your head around that, and there's a whole line of, of, of conferences to go into what's that going to mean, I'm going to just talk about specifically what it means for us, okay? Because it, that is different for us. The people who have been in this industry for the last 30 years, we started an industry where we didn't have to worry about selling a product. If we could find it, we could sell it, okay? Because the world was scarce, and the name of the game was capturing the resource, and so we grew up with sort of axioms around scarcity and built around scarcity and prices that, that were determined in a world of scarcity. Okay, now we've entered a different realm. So the North American unconventional uh, game has changed, and it's changed not just for the United States and Canada, but it's had knock-on effects around the world. There is no more E in EMP. Okay, the last time I heard somebody talk about a seismic line that mattered, okay, they were doing it to reduce their costs, potentially, in an overall field development. They weren't doing it to find oil and gas reserves, the way in the old days. If you think about the value chain in the old days around prospecting, around optioning up acreage, around shooting seismic, interpreting seismic. When we made the bets on, on these kind of broad brush plays, we were thinking about, well, if we, shot, if we bought this acreage or optioned it up, if we shot seismic, we anticipate having somewhere between four and 15 drillable prospects. If the average size of the four to 15 drillable prospects was X, and if the probability success was Y, this is kind of where, the, and the prices were this and that. That's the economics, okay? All that front end stuff now has changed. And that, in the United States and Canada, really no longer exists. Now, when I say it no longer exists, I'm going to just deviate for a minute. For those of people who have heard me speak before, I have to apologize. I use words like always, I use words like never, and I exaggerate to make my point. Do I mean that there, it's always that case? Could we find an anecdote that says it's not? Yes, of course we can. But for purposes of this audience, bear with me, okay? But I apologize because sometimes I get going. So now we're at a point in this industry where finding and capturing reserves is not the premium, okay? Because now it's a question of where are they? It's a question of what's the price point? And it's a question of how does it compete? Compete? How does our oil or our natural gas compete with other people's natural gas? It sounds like breakfast cereal. If we were marketing breakfast cereal, what is, it's a, we, can, we have an infinite opportunity of what kind of cereals we want to produce. So we ask ourselves, who are we competing against? What does our customer want? What does our distribution channel look like? What is our cost structure? What's going to be our price point? What's our value proposition? Because we can produce whatever we want, and the competition can produce whatever they want. That's a world of abundance. And so this time is different for the oil and gas industry, but it's a different for us. Congratulations. Our industry, thanks to many of the people in this room and in this state and in Texas, have changed the world. And as a result, we have now become a business just like any other business. So it is, it is different. So now we talk about, we don't think in terms of, well, how many dry holes can we, do we have to, we, might we get on a play, and can we amortize those dry holes across an entire play, you know, a play series, and will, it, will, the, will the entire project pay for itself given our respective failures that we're expecting? When you're dealing with a resource play, there might be a mechanical issue here and there, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's technological differences. There's some reservoir characteristics that are different, but before you go into full-scale development, you pretty much know what your averages are. And then you just, you're playing statistics, and you got to make your average, which means get your cost right, get your activity right, and go. Make sure you have your capital right, et cetera. So where are our risks? Because we don't really have this dry hole risk to amortize anymore. So our risks are more above ground. They're mechanical. They're in our offices. Okay? They're around our corporate culture. Corporate culture? When I started the oil and gas business, huh? Corporate culture? I don't need culture. I need to find a, I need to find an explorationist, a geophysicist who can find oil and gas. If he or she's the biggest jerk I've ever seen, that doesn't matter. They're going to find oil and gas because we're going to produce it and we're going to sell it. Now you're running an operating company. You're running a more of a manufacturing model. You need to think about corporate culture, recruiting and retaining people. Okay. Now that's all interesting. Um, but, but for people that have been around for a while, it's, you know, it's really kind of mind-blowing. The other mechanical risks um, are how you compare this from a, from a um, portfolio perspective. Because this is what people miss, I think. 
I mean, well, there's some other risks that are obvious. There's environmental risks, and there's um, there's government risks, there's regulatory risks, there's taxation, rule of law, et cetera. Um, and that can happen anywhere. I mean, people ask, why haven't we done much in California? And I say, because we don't like drilling internationally. And the <laughs> that's the the but so so you got to think about that when you're putting these large scale plays together. And it used to be you'd have to think about it too, but you also compounded it with the chance of failure with a dry hole, et cetera. Now you don't really have that. You really have to think about, do we want to be in this place for 20 years? Because we can drill for 20 years. And that was rarely the calculus for, the, for when we started in the industry. And so the, the questions around that are above ground um, are more important than ever. And that's really taken, that's a real sea change. Um, the... And so when you come down to it, the, the skills that were the skills for success before around, around finding oil and gas, you built a portfolio. You built a portfolio of opportunity. You built a portfolio of exploration. You built a portfolio of, then of production and operations. And you were always culling that portfolio, and you were working to fill in the front and send things out the back. And the you could go anywhere. And they had different economics. And you would sort of accept the fact that you had different economics. Well, economics in Indonesia are just different than they are in Louisiana. So politics aren't. But the, anyway, the, the, um, the, the nature of the portfolio, you were able to sort of bifurcate your brain because that's where the oil was. Well, if we're going to go to Venezuela, these are the risks we're going to have to take. Well, today, if you're a company, you don't have to go to Venezuela anymore because we're not in a world of scarcity. You don't want to sell cereal in Venezuela? Don't sell cereal in Venezuela. You can open up your plant somewhere else. It's okay. Plenty of other people to sell to, right? Just like any other industry. And so this whole concept now of having to go where the oil is is really quite different, and you have to almost compare everything. And this is where the North American industry has changed the calculus for the entire world. So if you're Exxon, we have people from Exxon here, I imagine, Exxon's now said, we're really going to back up the truck in North America. When I started, Exxon said North America is, a, is dead, and we're going to go internationally. This is a harvest province. Okay, and now and then when you bought XTO and now you said now we're really going to get get our costs right and get our get our processes in order so we can really go, um, that that's very different and it puts comparing your portfolio at the senior capital strategy level how you compare Angola to West Texas now you can because they can compete for capital and they can produce so it's a different you're in a world of scarcity you have to go to Angola because that's where the oil is. Right? But in today's world, um, it's not necessarily the case. So in that world of, scarce, of from, from scarcity to abundance, strategy matters more than ever. It's not just about execution. Strategy. Are you going to be a core player versus a non-core player? Are you going to be an acreage, buy acreage, drill a well and flip it? Or are you going to buy acreage and own it for 20 years and drill the heck out of it? Are you going to be a technology player? Are you going to stay? Are you going to just buy a bunch of mispriced options in tier one, tier two, and tier three acreage? Okay, these are strategic questions, all of which you can succeed at. They're not mutually exclusive. It's just they have different price points. They have different skills. No different. Are you going to be a high-end car dealer, car manufacturer? You're going to produce Lexuses or Toyotas. Same manufacturing plant. One has a Toyota strategy, and one has a Lexus strategy. All right? No different. Are we a core player? Got to pay more. Different skills to make it work. We're going to have to execute that way. Non-core, different set of skills. Different bet. Different way to make it work. Right? No different. So this time is not different for us. We've just now, it's, it's different for us. It's just not different for all of our friends. Um, they say, welcome to the party. This is the businesses that, they used to, that they're used to, where there's high competition, where strategy matters where you can make your mistakes on the first tee and never recover. These are the kinds of businesses. You're in the real estate business, you're exactly the same way. You can put up a building here or there. You can put up a building in Oklahoma City or Tulsa. You can put up a building in Dallas or Fort Worth. What's the market? What's the price point? What's my cost? Is that the right strategy? And then you go. And we'll find out later if it was right, but essentially you have this open, this kind of this open play, playground. So we now have this world where, where I believe strategy matters as much as execution. And so when strategy matters that much, you got to be clear on who you are and comes back to corporate culture and your corporate identity and your corporate skill sets as you build your teams around it. So this is now run like any other business. Competition is intense. There's things you can control and things you can't control. So focus on what you can. 
um, you have to know your customers. Customers. The oil and gas business has customers. It, I never had any customers. I mean, we had we had gatherers. We had the peop- We had truckers. We had people that came to pick up our product. But that was like an easy phone call to make. Um, Nigeria. Nigeria had a customer for their oil called the United States. They sent us about two and a half million barrels a day of light oil. Along comes the people in this room. Now we don't need their light oil anymore. Nigeria didn't didn't have trade agreements, hadn't cultivated, didn't have a didn't have a supply chain relationship with other customers. Now they're scrambled. They got to find some other customers for their light oil. Okay, and they could compete on price, but price is one, is just one thing because a customer says, well, I might buy this shipment from you, but I may buy, I want to buy a year's worth, five years worth, or ten years worth. Nigeria never had to worry about that. Because they're just shipping oil to us because we would take all that they could produce. But all of a sudden, they, they got displaced. They got disrupted because of the light oil that the United States started producing. And so these are examples. All, that's a big macro example. But these are examples all the way down the line where customer relations now matter. As I tell my people in other industries, my friends, they say to me, welcome to the party. You know, we've been spoiled by the fact that we didn't really need the kind of sales and marketing department that people who make a consumer product needs, but now we do. So things that things that uh, things that other people have have dealt with all the time, we are now having to deal with. The um, and so that's important. Um, the the other thing that's happened that 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 has changed uh, our business forever is that globalization has hit our business and that toothpaste is not going back in the tube. It doesn't matter how protectionist the United States get, the US can be both an importer and an exporter of oil at the same time. It matters which coast you're on, it matters where your product is. Okay, we, bo- we both import and export crude oil. We import and export refined products. Okay, just like cereals, just like corns and soybeans, it's okay. It's, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, and now we're an international player even if you're one field, a one field company selling to one refinery or one gatherer, you're now an international player, whether you like it or not. This is where we're different from the real estate business. You know, the real estate business, if you have a tenant, you're a small, small little um, office building, that's your, that's your business. You're not connected to the, you're not con- as connected. We are all connected. We have to watch OPEC politics and geopolitics now uh, as intensely as ever because our products have now become global products. Oil always was, but we were insulated because of the export ban. Now we're global. Same thing for gas. We were insulated because of the because it was impossible to export. Now we can both import and export. So Saudi Arabia, the Middle East, Iran, Syria, the Kurds, Iraq, Libya, the Saudi royal family, politics, Yemen, etc., all matter to the people in this room. And it does to think that it doesn't uh, is naive. So I'd encourage everybody to begin, if you're not already, read the Financial Times, and you'll get a little bit of taste. Um, but I would suggest not reading it at night because you won't sleep well. Um, Russia. Russia is a particularly peculiar animal right now. Think about what Putin has done. Okay? Just think for a minute. In the last three years, Putin has become the single most important person on this planet. The, he has simple goals. Modest goals, things like break NATO, get NATO off of his doorstep, reestablish the former Soviet Union, either legally or just through spheres of influence. In the Middle East, as soon as Obama erased the red line, Putin moves into Syria. Now permanent, permanent bases exist in Syria. Now he's aligning with Iran. We are in the middle of our negotiations with Iran. In the middle of the negotiations, and Russia signs a deal to build eight nuclear reactors for Iran. While we're in the middle of the negotiations, we're going back and forth. It's the total in-your-face move, okay? And Iran gladly signed it, and there was nothing we could do about it. The Ukraine, he took the Ukraine, he took took Crimea, um, and he's violated the Minsk II uh, treaty with impunity. Think about it today. There will not be a resolution of anything in the Middle East without talking to Putin. So he has inserted himself into the conversation to where now every peace negotiation or every ceasefire, every everything will involve a Russian at the table. 
the oil markets. Saudi Arabia, the, uh, Saudi Arabia essentially did battle with the U.S. oil producers and lost. Okay, they thought that, they, according to their consultants, they thought $70 to $80 a barrel was the price at which the United States would start buckling. So they decided to do battle with the entrepreneurs, many of whom are in this room, and they lost big time. And not only have we dropped our cost structure dramatically, we've taught the rest of the world how to drop their cost structure, to a point where OPEC blinked. So OPEC blinks, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but they come up with a 1.2 million barrel a day cut, provided that non-OPEC countries cut as well. Russia agrees to a 300,000 barrel a day cut out of a 1.8 million non-OPEC. So 300 out of 1.8 million. They weren't even the biggest player in the deck there. And for Putin, he basically said, I'm gonna, it's not his oil he was cutting, he's cutting his buddy's oil. right? He goes to Rosneft and said, you cut your oil. It's no skin off his teeth. So he basically shafted his friends out of it, out of their 300,000 barrels a day, and he inserted himself into the oil markets. And today, because Saudi Arabia has said, we're not going to unilaterally cut unless the rest of the non-OPEC producers cut as well, and he put himself as the linchpin, nothing will happen in the oil markets, period, without Russia. In fact, the non-OPEC countries, think about what happened. This is known as an OPEC cut, right? There were, there were 11 OPEC countries out of 13 that cut. There were two exceptions, Libya and Nigeria. But there were 12 non-OPEC countries that, that agreed to cut. So you, had, you basically had 23 countries that agreed to cut and less than half of them were OPEC. How is this different than simply people looking at the market and saying, you know what, there's more supply capacity than there is demand, we're not gonna fill it. Today, the United States sells, a, or consumers buy about 1.7 million cars a month, okay? So if you're General Motors and you're Toyota and you're BMW, and you decide how much you're going to produce, and you're Chrysler, you say how much we're going to produce. You don't sit around and say, oh, let's produce two and a half million, two, two and a half million cars this month, because the market's only 1.7. Okay? All that happened here was the market responded to supply and demand. The market re responded to the demand signals and said we're going to supply it. This was not just an OPEC cut. This was basically the market. No different than Delta, American, United, all looking at a route and saying, you know what, there's too many seats on that route. And whether they do it overtly or covertly doesn't really matter. But it's really interesting the way that Russia positioned themselves. Okay, so now we're in this situation where, as a global player, if you're walking the streets of Shreveport, congratulations, you're a suburb of Moscow, whether you like it or not. The Baltics, what Russia is doing in the Baltics militarily is incursion to do Estonia, the Jets playing games, dog and cat games with NATO. Um, you know, all of, this, all of this cat and mouse game is really important because it allows him to flex his muscle. At the same time, from a cyber standpoint, he's doing it in and around elections. Clearly, clearly there was some involvement on hacking involving the um, United States election. Um, I didn't see any RNC leaks. I only saw DNC leaks. Um, so it's interesting to me also to learn that, or it was interesting to me because I'm a nerd about these things, but that the Russians are single, the single largest funders of the nationalist political campaigns in Europe. So we'll see what happens, a big election coming up in France, but these nationalist candidates are playing right into Russia's hands of saying, we want to pull in, okay, so that Russia can make sure that it's got buffers around its borders. And all of this is right. It is all very interesting to me for a country that has a $1.3 trillion GDP. $1.3 trillion. Google and Apple combined market cap $1.3 trillion. So imagine Google and Apple getting together, controlling the Middle East conversation, controlling the oil market conversation, controlling, well, they may do control the cyber conversation, which we just don't even know it yet. Anyway, natural gas, I won't go into too much, um, but it's obvious now that with the LNG pricing um, being set off of Henry Hub, uh, it's changed the world, even though we're just getting ready to export on any, of any meaningful volumes. But they're still tiny, but we've actually changed the world in terms of LNG, uh, in terms of natural gas pricing. Um, I read somewhere that the most popular pres uh, prime minister candidate in Japan, um, if he ran, would be Henry Hub. Um, and nobody can find him, but he was, he was leading in the polls uh, in Japan. Um, the, uh, so who are the winners in this in this game? The winners are the consumers, right? When, when you're in a world of when you're we're in, in a world of surplus and people are fighting for market share, the only thing that matters from a consumer standpoint, you start getting better products at lower price. 
Um, and so that's, a, that's obvious. So that the local, and the lower cost producers are able to get all the market share they can handle. Um, and that's true of almost any other commodity or any other product. The losers, high cost producers, people who are playing the old game, who are playing yesterday's game of trying to figure out how can I go capture reserves. Okay? If, you can't, if you are not thinking about what is your cost structure and where you fit in the global cost structure, then you're missing something. Oil and gas countries that are reliant upon that product are having are have, have a real uh, a real difficult chance depending upon where they are in the cost curve. Think Mexico. Okay, Saudi Arabia gets it. Can Saudi Arabia increase their production from 10 million barrels a day to 12? Probably. Can they go to 20? No. All right. So when you think about where they are, they're about where they are. Maybe they can add another 10, another million barrel a day, maybe two. Okay, but they're not going to really they're not going to double from here. So when they start thinking about how do I handle an economy with 25, 30 million people where the average age is about 25 years old and I got a lot of people that need to find jobs and build lives, they're, they're in a scramble now to figure out how to diversify their economy. Not all of their oil is in the right part of the cost curve. And so they're looking at it too in the same way. Um, and so Venezuela is in a world of hurt because they're on the wrong side of the cost curve and they have all sorts of societal problems. Um, renewables, I think, are in trouble where they exist on the wrong part of the cost curve, with the exception that if states and sovereigns can support them and continue to subsidize them, they're okay, except in a world where most states and sovereigns have fiscal problems, that's not a sustainable formula. The world's going to rely on hydrocarbons for, as far as my eye can see, uh, demand growth is between one and one and a half million barrels a day per year, probably for at least the next decade. Um, all the gains in efficiency in our world, all the gains in alternatives in our world will just slow the rate of growth while the rest of the world takes up the slack. So those old days are gone and they're not coming back. And those wishing for the old days to come back are really singing the wrong song. As Waylon Jennings sang, my wife ran off with my best friend and I sure do miss him. The, the, for those who sit here and think, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe it's going to come back, I'd say it might come back, but it's not going to come back in a way that we remember, okay? We have now joined the world, welcome to the party, at what, what most other businesses live with, where it's, it's all about production, costs, customers, and service. So that's the, that's the energy market commentary. Um, and I have a few minutes and I'll talk a little bit about, uh, about my new role. I'm not gonna talk about oil and gas pricing. Um, but in my new role as I went to senior advisor of NGP um, and, and sit on their investment committee, so I'm still very much, they have my money and, and they have my attention, they just don't have all of my time anymore. Um, so I'm very, very much involved in the energy business from a thought perspective, um, but we have a really, really wonderful team that's out doing transactions. Um, but now I get the chance to think, to come up a level and think about what is happening in the world. And in the world we live in today, we're in a, we're in a real quandary. Um, F. Scott Fitzgerald said the test of first-rate intelligence is the ability to, to hold two opposing thoughts in your head at the same time and still retain the ability to function. Um, I don't know if we've completely lost the ability to function, but bear with me and let's just pretend we still have the ability to function. So there's two thoughts that are happening big picture right now um, in the marketplace uh, that I believe um, bears substantial watching. First of all, the positive. The current optimism in the markets around around what's happening it is okay real china growth is six to six and a half percent on an 11 trillion dollar economy okay don't worry about the six and a half percent right six percent on a 10 11 trillion dollar economy is better than a 10 percent on a five trillion dollar economy okay so they're growing just fine the u.s is in the two to three percent growth india six to seven percent growth markets are up economies near statistical full employment interest rates and energy prices are low um, we have a we have a, a aligned aligned administration with Congress. Um, we are talking about regulatory rollback. We're talking about maybe some tax cuts. We're, we're, we're talking, and at the same time, we have this fourth industrial revolution going on around robotics and artificial intelligence and innovation and 3D printing and really substantive changes. This is all very, very exciting, driving new efficiencies and new industries, okay? That, that is a bullish set of facts. On the other side of the equation, we have heightened uncertainty. And I would categorize the uncertainty as different this time. Not different from 70 years ago, but different from the last 15 to 20 years. In the last 15 to 20 years, if you were to catalog global risks, they would generally live in the developing economies. You'd be talking about instability, you'd be talking about some countries may fail, governments may turn, is Venezuela gonna turn or not, what's gonna happen? And these are in developing worlds. 
Now if you were to catalog the risks, you would talk about is the EU going to sustain itself? Okay, you're going to talk about is growth going to slow in the United States? Is political gridlock and our fiscal deficit going to finally hit the point where we're not able to really manage our debt burden? Okay, these are, and, and then what's happening in China? These are developed wor world risks. Okay, and that's, that's kind of risen above the, uh, the, old, the old list. Okay, the old list is probably still percolating out there, but that's a sea change, and that's where we get a little bit dangerous. Um, we have growth slowing, top line growth slowing. We have income inequality. We have different, different countries participating differently. We have different people within countries participating differently. And very importantly, democracy and capitalism, for the first time in my life, are not the axiomatic solution. They're not the way people say, well, of course you want to be democratic and ha ca have good capitalist rules uh, governing society. You have places in China, China's saying our state capitalist model are, you know, is, is better. And Singapore is fine. And then you have places, you have Putin, which is challenging in Russia, Erdogan in Turkey, Orban in Hungary, Duda in Poland, the rise of the nationalist parties throughout Europe. This is now entering the mainstream that maybe democracy and capitalism isn't necessarily the way to go. 50% of students on college campuses today have said it's not necessarily important for me to live in a capitalist country. That is scary for me, okay? And that's different. That number was about 10 or 15 percent 30 years ago, okay? So that's a big difference where somehow I never had to argue with my kids about whether or not democracy was a good thing or capitalism was a good thing. We can talk about shades of capitalism. Should we regulate here or there or the other thing? But it was never sort of the base level of assumption. We didn't have to challenge. But that is challenging around the world in the developed economies. Don't take your eye off of that. Anti-globalization isn't just noise, okay? There was serious anti-globalization right up to World War II, and a period from globalization to anti-globalization, it took a world war. It caused a world war to, to, to really nail the, where, where the world wanted to go. So these existential threats, and I haven't even talked about North Korea, but these are existential threats that for the first time in my life, I, asked the, I have to ask my question, what if this were to happen? Would my son enlist? Would I encourage him to enlist? When I read stories about my grandfather's generation where they felt um, they felt guilty if they had flat feet and somehow couldn't pass their physical and enlist, if they had to be homebound, okay, could you see our peers and our children doing that today? Would we? What would ha what would it take for us to feel so nationalistic that we're going to that we want want to go serve or we want to go fight and? Th these, in my lifetime, I'm a peacetime guy, okay? I grew up after Vietnam and before 9-11. And to me, I've had this great luxury, and most in this room have had this luxury. And so, but for the first time now, these questions are not buried down at the bottom of the shelf, and they've started to percolate up. Um, and that, to me, is, is where you have existential threats, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in the Middle East, whether it's in Asia, What's happening with cyber? What's happening in the South China Sea? I promise they're going to hand out some Prozac and Xanax when I leave um, to make sure you guys are all okay. Um, the, and, and is Europe, is Europe going to even exist the way we know Europe? Now, the people that remember what traveling Europe and actually carrying 10 different currencies in their pocket said, well, that wasn't such a bad thing. But people who've done business there understand that the EU has really been a net positive. So given these two opposing forces, what does it all mean, and how does, it, how, do, how does it come to bear? I would say that globalization isn't going backwards. Okay, that toothpaste is out of the tube. I don't care what Do President Trump says. Okay, and you saw in today's Wall Street Journal, he says, well, now that he sees more of the facts, eh, maybe we'll just amend NAFTA a little bit. Okay, it is, it is, it is clearly naive to think that supply chains are going to be rewritten, but, but if you have this clash between the economic facts and the political populist motivations, that's where real clashes happen. Technological disruption. Good luck putting that toothpaste back in the tube. It ain't going to happen. We better understand that. We better get ready for it. We better train for it. New business models, big data, efficiency, the Uberization, new communication models. This is all happening, and it ain't going backwards. Demographics. We have an aging population, period, full stop. The number of retirees to working people in our country, it's, the, it's different than it was 30 years ago. Okay, and so we have a problem, and that problem is, is getting more and more near. How is this country going to deal with that in the age of technological change? So these are the things that are happening, and, it will, and at a time, in my opinion, when global solutions are needed the most, we are most skeptical of global institutions. And that's the issue, and that's what troubles me.
So where are we, where do, where do I think we are, how we can um, resolve the situation? Um, I think the first of all is we have, we have to be active. And we have to be active politically and economically and with our education institutions, because it's really a three battle war. We have to make sure that, that our workforce is ready for jobs of the 21st century. We have to make sure that our institutions are functional. And that means governing from the middle, okay, which takes you to the third battle, and that is we have to keep the political gravitational pulls of both poles at bay and govern toward the middle. And so those, those and, and work around bolstering these institutions that exist to help people cooperate and stay together, okay? And these are institutions that were designed for completely different things. The UN Charter, I've read it. It does not say the UN should be uh, charged with managing the climate. But now that's sort of evolved. But that's okay. Institutions are able to evolve if the people who are around them enable it. So I think that's a very important thing um, that, we, that, has to be, that has to happen. And it has to happen globally because the U.S. fiat power is gone. Not just Trump. Trump is a reaction, okay? I think we've really understood the fact that the United States, what the United States says we're going to go do, doesn't mean that people are going to go with us and doesn't mean we're going to be, be able to get it done. And in my opinion, that's really because of a couple key facts. Number one is we were always able to, to have credibility because we had a good balance sheet. When we said, damn it, this is a red line, we're going to go to war, we could afford it. Today, do you think we could afford the kind of mobilization that we had 50 years ago? Not on our balance sheet, and the world knows it. And they hear it. They hear people talking about maybe, you know, what's our, what's our defense as a percentage of, of our GDP? Our willingness to use force abroad revolved around oil for the most part. If our oil lanes were disrupted, it would be crippling to our economy. And so our hands were tied. And when your hands are tied, your adversaries know exactly what to do. So don't cross that line because they know we're coming in. But thanks to the unconventional shale revolution, we don't need Saudi Arabia oil. 17 million barrels a day pass through the Straits of Hormuz. One million barrels a day comes to the United States. Okay, and that's Saudi Arabia sending it to their own refinery. All right, and they do that for political reasons is my guess. But we, if that got shut, would it hurt the global oil price? Absolutely. Would we be able to keep the lights on? Absolutely. That's new. And that's new. So our hands aren't necessarily tied. We can choose which battles we want to fight as it relates to oil, which was a very, very serious force in our credibility because it was kind of playing the game of chicken with the opponent who throws the steering wheel out the window. You know exactly where he's going. And so now what are you going to do? It's all up to you. So, that, so to me, I think that that's, that, in my opinion, uh, is what's happened, and it was exacerbated uh, under the previous administration who added $9 trillion of debt more than the entire history of our country um, and essentially lost credibility because uh, once you lose credibility, it's one thing for me to be a good bluffer but if I always win bluffing, but if I bluff and then show my cards and, hey, you know I was bluffing, then over time you're going to say, well, he might be bluffing, he's probably bluffing, and you lose your credibility, what you're going to say. And when you're playing a game of credibility, that's critical. And too many, too many pitches, we watched these pitches go down the middle and we didn't swing at them. And eventually our adversaries figured that out. And so we've lost our credibility. And so today the people on this planet, I think, matter more than the institutions on this planet. Okay, I think the UN has taken a back seat. Okay, I think we lost it with TPP. We've lost our ability to have a, to have a, a trade organization that works. Um, and so people like Putin and Xi and Trump and Merkel and Draghi and Netanyahu, they're driving the agenda. They're driving the forces on this planet. It's not the UN, the Duma, Congress, okay, the WTO. Right? And so that to me is the difference, is when you have, when you have people starting to matter more than institutions, um, that we have a big risk. So I think that, that we, have, we have an opportunity, um, but it's something that's going to take everybody and it's going to take some time. So I'm honored to uh, be around former President Bush um, and being around somebody who was a very principled leader, whether it was popular or not popular, you knew where he stood. Um, his, his definition of safe, safety and security uh, was if you want to be safe and secure at home, you better have freedom and democracy abroad. Otherwise, it'll end up on your shores. And that was his line. Um, and that, that was apparent to him after 9-11. Um, economically, it's about free markets uh, and open opportunity. It's about being a strong and compassionate country at home and abroad and not a vindictive country. Not worried that what I have, and if, if you have less than I have, then somehow I took it from you. But rather, let's work on lifting everybody, okay, and not worry about fighting so much amongst ourselves. And those are wonderful principles that I've uh, 
uh, I've been happy to support uh, at the Bush Center in my second life, um, and but I still uh, have found myself uh, pulled uh, back into this wonderful industry that has uh, really been the epicenter of change, um, and and it's been change that's been dramatic, and it's not going back to the way it was. Um, so I will uh, I will end by saying uh, that I'm proud uh, mostly of the of what this industry has meant to the world because it has increased opportunity, it has increased economic advantage, it has democratized, it has democratized what previously was a world of scarcity into a world of abundance. So welcome to the business party just like everyone else and everybody will do just fine. Thank you for having me. It's your show. Jay says we have time for a couple questions. Yes, sir. You touched on uh, the South China Sea. Uh, care to comment more on how you see that playing out? Um, yeah, uh, the South China Sea, Russia uh, has taken over, you know, rocks uh, and called them islands. In low tide, they're, they don't they exist. In high tide, they don't. In some of the cases, um, the uh, this is about. Uh, it, it's not a it's not an accident that when we pivoted to Asia. Um, these rocks became really important territorial aspects. Um, I, my, first, I'll talk about motivation. Motivation, I believe, is not military. They are putting mili- that's what they know. That's their currency. I mean, if you're, if, and we would do the same thing. When we settled Guam, we put a base there, you know, and that's okay. That's you know, that's what you do with a forward position. Um, but I think it relates again back to this room. So if you go back 10 years, if you go back 15 years, and China's doing their plan, and their plan says economic growth and oil demand looking like this, and their oil supply looks like this, they need resources. So what do they do? They go on a buying binge all over the world. They go into places that we wouldn't go, like Sudan, Venezuela. They make deals with everybody to buy resources so that they can own them in a world of scarcity. Now all of a sudden the unconventional shale revolution comes up and goes, oh, you mean I can just buy as much breakfast cereal as I need? Wow, then I don't need to have all these cereal plants everywhere. Why did I spend all this money for breakfast cereal manufacturing all over the place, right? And so now what do they care about? When they can get their supply from anywhere, because supply is effectively infinite, now what matters to them are the shipping lanes. Because if I'm, if I'm a buyer, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to own, I want to buy. So if I'm going to buy, I don't want to be beholden to one supplier, and I don't want to be beholden to one bridge, or one highway, okay? So by the, and so when they look at their map and they see various straits and various passages and they say, you know what, we're that's a choke point. And so they're trying to expand their sphere of influence and their sphere of control. In my mind, to to say, oh well, there might be oil and gas around it. I mean, that's just that's ludicrous. So I do think it's about influence and it's about keeping their economy going. Um, and then a, a knock-on effect, which, hey, as a side benefit, you know, we basically get to extend our, our flex our muscles vis-a-vis all the Southeast Asian countries. Um, so I, I would not personally uh, believe that China would go to war to defend one of those. And they've proven that, right? We, they, they had the identification, you know, mandate that we have to identify and we just said to hell with that and we ships right through it and flew right over them. And they didn't, you know, they said stop or we'll say stop again. I mean, it didn't really matter. Um, and so I think that they've telegraphed what they is. So I think that's that's their that's their game. Um, and it's a smart game. We would be doing the same thing um, if somebody were, if we had a choke point, if we got all of our all of our goods through the Panama Canal, we might say, you know, well, geez, we better do something about it. But Panama Canal is only one thing. Good question. You mentioned North Korea. Did you, you said you were going to come back to that. Oh, no, I said I wasn't going to come back to North Korea. I've never been to North Korea. I'm never going back to North Korea. Anyway, um, North Korea. Uh, North Korea is a dicey situation, um, obviously, because it's gotten so far. Um, so North Korea is a. Uh, the question of North Korea is how you engage two things. And the Bush Center just came out with a uh, set of policy recommendations, with a, which was done bipartisanly um, in our shop. We just issued it at the very end of November. BushCenter.org, if anybody's interested, you can go find them. But there's two things. Number one is you want to link human rights. You don't want to make this about a nuclear, uh, nuclear only or defense only, whether he's offensive or defensive. You want to link human rights to it. Um, because you have 20, over 20 million people who are living under tyranny. You have over 120,000 political prisoners that are there just for their beliefs, um, and that's unsustainable. 
Um, and so it's, you have a powder keg that could happen. Imagine if there was a revolution there, right? What comes next? So you have a powder, it, could it be similar? Sure, you have a powder keg with nuclear reactors. That's a bad combo. So we have to link human rights to it, and we have to make it China's problem. China owns it just like we own it, okay? And China needs to understand. So, so we should absolutely, in my opinion, put the missile defense up, okay? Because everybody knows that North Korea has permanent missiles pointed to, down to South Korea. And if we launch something, they might get launched. So it's not offensive for us to do that, and it's not unreasonable for us to do that. We do that in Europe. Um, Israel does it. I mean, so for a free society to do that, to be defensive is okay. And I don't think China is somehow going, they may disagree with it, but I don't think they're going to go to war over it. So I think we're in a situation where it's really important for us to engage China and make sure that China understands that this is in their sphere and they do not want, they do not want, they, they shouldn't fear a reunified Korean peninsula. Okay, they shouldn't fear that, number one. And number two is they have to be part of the solution. So that's it's hard, that's a, that's a tougher issue. And on that happy note, wait, there's one in the back. Last question. Could you expand on your uh, thought of the Russia-Chinese relationship and how that expects to play out with the U.S. in the next 20 years? I don't, uh, Russia-China uh, relationship doesn't, I don't lose a lot of sleep over that. Um, those, that's a marriage of convenience. Um, on in certain respects there there is nervous Russia's as nervous about China uh, as as they are with their sights on Europe um, so that I don't worry about as much I don't I don't think they, they play in the same sphere I think Russia is looking towards their influence in Europe and I think their relationship with China is just a is one it's commercial okay and it's one of selling gas and oil to them um, and it's maintaining some sort of dialogue but I don't I don't see sort of this two against one scenario. I think that the United States, if I were to, if I were to do, to look at near-term risks, um, our, our biggest near-term risk, other than terrorism, which is, which is a, a perpetual risk that could happen with this asymmetry situation where we have big armies and then little terrorist groups, how, it's, very, very hard to, it's very hard to combat that. Um, we're just not necessarily set up for that, and so we're constantly changing to figure that out. Um, but near-term, North Korea is a big risk, um, and then our relationship with Russia um, because of where Putin has positioned himself is, is kind of a near-term risk. Longer term, it's, it's the relationship between us and China, okay? Russia is still a $1.3 trillion economy, okay? So, and, and geographically and, and trade, I mean, we don't trade that much with them. I mean, so from the relationship between the United States and China, as China goes from an $11 trillion economy to a $15 trillion economy and starts, um, whether they flex their muscles and how they do it, um, and who their trading partners are uh, will, is, is the longer term risk. And I don't see Russia as, as being a factor one way or the other to that dynamic. Um, so you saw that the Russians set up the, um, the Asian uh, in Infrastructure Investment Bank. And we said to our allies, don't do it. They're just trying to buy you off. They're, they're waving their checkbook to try to fund your projects to get you involved in this development bank. Um, Almost every one of our allies said, <laughs> we're going to do it anyway. Um, and 57 countries except us signed on. So the U.S. Is, has, has basically lost its influence. And so the question for China is, China is and will be a great country. The question is whether they're going to be a good country. That's the question. And the United States needs to be an example and help them become a good country. Thank you.